right, everybody. I'm Sterling Holmes. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Sterling. Wow. Hmm. To God's grace, this program and sponsorship, I have not found it necessary to take a drink since the 2nd of June, 1981. And for that, I am truly, truly, truly grateful. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. I don't know if you're impressed by that date, but I'm impressed. <laughs> since I've been hanging out with y'all, I haven't had to drink. And that's pretty impressive. So if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, it's possible. <laughs> it's highly likely if you hang out with these people, you know, and I, I know they look weird. <laughs> I know sometimes they act weird, but they're good people. I'd, I'd get to know them if I were you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, thank you, um, the committee, Steve, um, everybody that had anything to do with bringing me out here tonight. I am filling in for some big shoes that were supposed to be to kick this thing off, and you know, um, so I apologize because I'm not Doug. So if you're sitting there looking at the program going, how do you spell Doug again? <laughs> it, it's spelled right. It's just the wrong day. That's it. So I'm, I'm a fill-in. But, you know, come tomorrow because you're going to hear something. You're going to hear something. <laughs> but I am pleased to be here to start this thing off. I have been here with Roxanne. Thank you for bringing Roxanne and I both out. We, we give you greetings from Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, there are alcoholics in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> We've got 500 meetings in Omaha, Nebraska. A lot of drunks in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> My home group is the Fox Hall Group of Omaha, Nebraska. We meet on Tuesday night, 7.30. Yep, some people have heard of it. We're trying to franchise the whole thing. Ain't working. <laughs> but we'd keep trying. 7.30. We start at 7.30. We have two speakers. We give away uh, 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 literature. We sing happy birthday all off key. And uh, it's a mess. <laughs> but in my opinion, it's the best home group in AA. There was an old timer that used to say, <laughs> old timer used to say, if you don't think your home group is the best home group ever, stay there. <laughs> don't go somewhere else messing that one up. <laughs> so, so I love my home group. I, I truly, truly do. I think it's the best, best AA in the world. But I got to say, Texas does show off quite a bit, I tell you. It's amazing how y'all can just come and, and annex a whole state. Just <laughs> the, the convention. Everybody that called me had, how you doing? I'm from so-and-so Texas, and I want to invite you to Colorado. I was like, huh? <laughs> Are they pissed at Colorado or what? <laughs> What's going on, you know? But that, that's just the way y'all do it, and I love the way y'all do it. We've been, we've been fed. We've been taken care of. It has been really, really good, and thank you so much. This is a very special, a week-long convention like this is something magical. 30 years of doing this and having this kind of enthusiasm and this kind of spirit, something's going on here. And if you're a newbie like I am, I, even though I don't have a red dot on my thing, I'm, this is my first time here. If it's your first time here, don't make it your last. Because this is this something really something, there's something really going on here. It really is, really is. I mean, I've been to a lot of places, and this is kind of, woo, yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The desserts alone, I tell you. So <laughs> just hmm. anyway, anyway, I am a I am a very grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am not in AA because I saw the light. I'm in AA because I felt the heat. <laughs> I was in trouble. That's what got me here. Now my full name is Sterling David Holmes III. Isn't that something? <laughs> now when you got a Roman numeral at the end of your name, you're supposed to get a country to run. <laughs> Louis XIV, Charles V, I'm waiting for my country. <laughs> At seven, I got a little sister that moved to my room in the South Bronx, pissed me off. <laughs> so I'm aware of resentments from the get-go, you know? I'm one of those kids that, I'm, I don't know, like the lady that was working the youth program, she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could reach, us, reach them with the 12, the 12 steps, the principles of alcohol? I don't know, I need a sponsorship in kindergarten. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> it would have been nice, because when I went to the kindergarten, there was two groups, me, and all them. <laughs> it would have been nice to be able to put a dime in there. What do I do? <laughs> Eat the cookie, take the nap. That's all you got to do when you're in kindergarten. <laughs> but I've always been on the outsider, on the outside, looking in, you know? Needed that kind of stuff. I mean, I grew up in the South Bronx. It really doesn't matter that I grew up in the South Bronx. But, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx, and we had the interesting things going on, you know? <laughs> 
It was in Fort Apache, the, one of the toughest you know, police precincts in the South Bronx. You know, there was a lot of interest, like I said, interesting things going on. There was a lot of things going on. There was some good things going on. There was churches, and there were liquor stores. Now, you know which ones I kind of adhered to, you know? I kind of moved towards them liquor stores. I like them liquor stores. Well, did the lights go out or what? Didn't you? I've always been right-handed anyway, so it's going to be good. But, you know, I mean, it really doesn't matter where I grew up, you know, but I, I was always a kid that was, I was riddled with fear. I was always worried about how I came off and what was going on and what was worried about me, because I think about me all the time. My grand sponsor says I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> and I like that, because I can relate to that. I can relate to that. That's the way I am. So, you know, I was always thinking about me, what about me, and on condition yellow constantly. You know, I grew up in Catholic school. Um, I don't have a problem with the Catholic doctrine. I really don't. Some of the nuns that taught it to me weren't wrapped too tight, but other than that, <laughs> pretty much good program. Now, I remember asking a, a nun on a summer's day in New York, you know, sister, how can you have a virgin birth? And she was not prepared to discuss that profound theological concept with an eight-year-old. <laughs> so she hit me and sent me to the principal. And while I was sitting there waiting for the principal to come hit me some more, I realized to myself that you grown-ups don't have all the answers. Now, I've already set the stage for you. I, I already feel different wherever, ever, everywhere I go. I don't want to believe adults anymore. Coming up with my own stuff, and I'm riddled with fear. So, you know, I was destined to show up here. You know, and if it hadn't been for a talk and a Code 45, I probably would have been long gone from here. So, in a sense, uh, the talk and a Code 45 on a summer's day in the South Bronx saved my life. Because I was 13 years old with a maelstrom going on in my head and something had to quiet it. Something had to change my perception of life on life's terms or otherwise I wasn't going to survive. And I thank alcohol for that. Because it did, in fact, change my perception. I took that tall can Code 45 down on a summer's day and I felt like I could speak as well as Jesse Jackson, play sports as well as Reggie Jackson, <laughs> dance as well as Michael Jackson. <laughs> And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the thing is, if it was working that way for me today, I would still be out tonight being one of the Jacksons. <laughs> I'd have been moonwalking all the way down Crest of Butte. <laughs> That'd be the deal. But it stopped working. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous and wondering, you know, well, what is it about this thing? Well, you know, even though it had stopped working, it became injurious to me. I couldn't stop working it. It was my solution, and it is still a solution for me today. There's a lot more stuff I can do instead, but if I stop doing that stuff, that solution rises with a bullet. And regardless of how long that I've been sober or how many things that I have had happen to me of a spiritual nature in and outside of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I get angry, irritable, and discontented enough, and there are no other solutions available to me, I default to my original position which is drunk and disorderly. That's it. That's what makes me an alcoholic, because I still got the alcoholic mind. I still got it. It's running right between my ears. What about me? You know? I always called alcohol my pimp. So you know what that made me, right? So if I don't do this program, I get that, come on back, baby. You know I love you, baby. I won't hurt you this time, baby. You know, I, that's what will come starting in my head. I know it. It's inevitable. So if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, I know probably somebody sent you here because they had a poor sense of humor or they just didn't. <laughs> just stay a while long enough to be convinced that, you know, it's really not a solution for you. Because I realize today, after 32 years of sobriety plus, it's still a solution for me today. You know, I started drinking at 13. I remember dating this girl, and I wanted to impress her, and you always impress a girl with things you can do well. So I challenged her ex-boyfriend to a drinking contest. <laughs> and we were drinking hot, cheap gin in the South Bronx. Yeah, see, a lot of hot, cheap gin drinkers out here. Out here. <laughs> Get you there, don't it? <laughs> Got me there, passed me out, too. We <laughs> became a salt slumber party, you know? <laughs> I woke up the next morning embarrassed and mortified after being told what had happened the night before, and I blamed it all on bad onion dip. It had to be the onion dip. <laughs> Couldn't have been that gin I was drinking or the three or four beers I had to get ready. Now, if you're one of those kind of people that when you go to, a, to drink, you got to get ready to go drinking, <laughs> stay here this week, okay? Because <laughs> there's something really wrong, you know? 
you got to go have a drink to get ready to go drink it. <laughs> you know, and that's us. We love doing that. But, but I, I, it was my solution. And because it was my solution, I was not willing to give it up. And, of course, I got in trouble. We all always get in trouble. We always end up doing bizarre stuff. You know, and I, I knew that, you know, I was getting kind of weird, but I still wanted to do it. And I went to, uh, I was a pretty intelligent kid, you know, went to four different colleges. <laughs> Don't have a degree in any one of them. But my sponsor says I'm educated beyond my intelligence, you know. And I had always, you know, I wanted, to, I was really uncomfortable with my life because my family was kind of, well, you can look at me and tell mom wasn't Donna Reed, right, you know. <laughs> You know, I watched those television shows in the 60s and 70s where, you know, the engineer came home promptly at 6. You know, she always came out with an apron on. Dinner started. If there was a problem with Junior, they solved it in a half an hour, you know. There was always the split-level A-framed house, manicured lawn, the whole deal, right? I lived on the 18th floor in the project, so, you know, there was no lawn to mow. And I have been to thousands of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, thousands, conservatively, thousands of meetings. And I've sat next to Beaver Cleaver. <laughs> and he's just as screwed up as I am. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. But it always mattered to me. I always wanted whatever I couldn't seem to have. You know, I was looking for that. I was always like that, that I guess Carl Jung characterized us as being an inordinate thirst for the spirit, for God. An inordinate thirst. We had this desire to fill this hole. And I found alcohol filled it temporarily, but did it pretty well. You know, and I got into a situation where I knew I needed to, I always wanted to join a gang. Because in my neighborhood, some of the gangs were really, they were really tight. They had a really strong bond with one another. They looked out for each other. They would, you know, they would show up if somebody was in trouble. And I liked that. And I wanted to join a gang. But none of the friends of mine who knew that my parents were spending a lot of money to give me a good education wanted to join me into a gang. If, they want, if I was going to destroy my life, I was going to have to do it on my own. Because the gang, the friend, gang members, friends of mine who were gang members were not willing to do that. You know, that's kind of the way gangs were back then. So I decided to join a big gang, the Department of Defense. <laughs> if you're going to join a gang, join a gang that's got nuclear weapons. So I raised my hand and joined the United States Air Force, and they did not know at the time that I was an alcoholic. See, because we knew what alcoholics looked like in New York. I don't look like an alcoholic, because I didn't have, we had the alcoholic had the long overcoat and the puddle in front of him and the brown paper bag. That's an alcoholic laying up against the building. One guy had a little monkey, one of them little green monkeys, you know, he'd get drunk and the monkey would guard him. So I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic because I didn't have no monkey. So they thought they were getting a reasonably sane individual, and, you know, and I joined. And, and I think that my alcoholism progressed not because the military enabled me. I think my alcoholism progressed because you, your alcoholism will progress if you do three things as far as I'm concerned. If you acquire these three things, your alcoholism will bloom. And I, I always say that if you're going to do it right, you need an income. Don't have to be your income, <laughs> but you need an income. Need a place to crash. Again, doesn't have to be yours, <laughs> but it's important. And then, you know, food in the beginning, towards the end, no big deal. <laughs> you know? And that's what they provided to everybody in the military, along with the training and everything else. And so, of course, my alcoholism bloomed, and I started to do a lot of bizarre things. And if, you know, <laughs> and people react to the bizarre things that we think are commonplace. Because most of us can understand the compelling reasons to being naked on your lawn. <laughs> most of us really, know the, the subtleties and the nuances of, of you know, maybe in doing just a little too much and, you know, knocking on the wrong door or, you know, ending up in the wrong house or, you know, those kind of things just happen. They come along with the deal. But people out there, they react to that kind of stuff. <laughs> and they start giving you those looks. You know, and I knew that I was getting in trouble, and I, I do had to do something about it. So a selfish, self-centered person like me, on condition yellow, always in fear, looking for outside stuff to fix inside problems, I knew exactly what I needed, a relationship. <laughs> I need somebody to help me love me. Because alcoholics don't date. We hunt down and we capture, Jack. And I always thought we were pretty good hunters. Now I find out that the hunted would probably be doing the hunting too. You know, that's the thing. They were, they were faking being lame, you know, so we could pounce. I 
I did find the object of my obsession. I found the her. And I pursued relentlessly. And I really, when I married her, I intended on being a good husband, a good dad, and a good father, a good member of the military. I had all the plans in the world of being a good person. But when you suffer from alcoholism, alcoholism is a rapacious creditor. It takes everything. It has no room for you to take any, to have anything else in your life. You're either going to do alcoholism or all this other stuff. That's it. Those are your choices. If you're new in AA and you don't think you're an alcoholic, okay, cool. But if you go back out there and you start losing stuff, come on back. Because, you know, you, it's, you're going to have to lose everything. Because alcoholism does not make allowances for any of the other stuff. And, of course, it was evident. Before uh, she got sent overseas first, and I was still in school, and before I got a chance to go overseas to, school, uh, to be with her, my mother got hit by a car, knocked about 50, 55 feet, put in a coma, and on the 2nd of September, 1978, she died. Um, Mom and I had a real difficult relationship. Every once in a while, Mom would get, you know, she got divorced very, when I was like 10, 10 or 11, 12 years old, and, you know, and so a single parent, you know, out there. She, she was also a narcotics officer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Made me real popular in the neighborhood, let me tell you. <laughs> but every once in a while, Mom would get a little on the depressed side, and on a Saturday night, you could find my mom sometimes passed out on the floor after drinking a few too many screwdrivers, listening to them all, Otis Redding and... Gladys Knight and the Pibs and, you know, all the you know, all them old, sad blues songs, you know, on the record. Yeah, for the newcomer, we used to have these things called a record player. It was a <laughs> big, it was bigger than a CD and it had a smaller hole and you used to put it in the, and play, and play music, but, uh, you know. So I'd come home and I'd turn that thing off and I'd put it in bed and I'd say, I'll never do that. And I never did. I never passed out. I passed out on the couch and I played Earth, Wind & Fire records, which is completely different. <laughs> completely different. But mom, was, mom, mom had lost her Mobile, Alabama accent in, in uh, Washington, D.C. at Howard University. Probably one of the smartest women I ever met. Taught me how to read before I got into first grade. Um, and I treated her like crap. I was a terrible son. It's all the guilt. And, you know, alcoholics with guilt, we drink a lot. Because you've got to swallow that guilt. And that guilt creates more situations that creates more guilt. So you've got to drink more, do more drinking. And the dr more drinking creates more situations you feel guilty about. And you get in, into that cycle. And the last two years of my drinking were characterized by the, you know, was, was started actually after she passed away. And it was crazy, insane drinking. I got sent over to Japan, and in Japan, they drive on the wrong side of the road. And sometimes I get so drunk, I couldn't remember what side of the road I was supposed to be on. So I drive down the middle. <laughs> that kind of bizarre behavior warrants some people getting interested in your life. I mean, you know, they start asking you questions. And if you drink like I drank, you can't answer those questions. So you respond in anger and, you know, frustration of blaming a lot of other people and all that good stuff that we do to try to stay out of trouble. And gradually we just keep getting in more trouble, you know. And it closed in on me. It was terrible. I mean, one time I reported the car stolen in the club, and it was the only car on the upper level in the parking lot at that time. <laughs> and normies take a very dim view. If you can't find it, they won't let you drive it. <laughs> they really just, you know, they're serious about that. So I had gotten to a place where it started to cave in on me. And I got pulled into the commander's office. And he said, Sterling, I'm giving you two weeks to volunteer for inpatient treatment, basically. Well, the military version was called alcohol education. You've got two weeks to volunteer or I'm going to send you on my order. And if you don't make it out, you're out of the Air Force. So you know how long it took me to, take, to make that decision, don't you? There you go. See? <laughs> I am a room, I'm in a room full of people who understand. We are the only group of folks faced with the calamity and the associated attendant problems associated with alcoholism and an opportunity to find some peace, some worth, some happiness, some sense of purpose, and they ask us to choose. We're the only group in the world that got to think about that. <laughs> Insanity or death, happiness and usefulness. Uh... <laughs> okay, dying in my own urine or coffee maker. <laughs> Can I get back to you? You know? We're the only group. Because anybody else has got a fatal illness, and you tell them all they got to do is read a book and call a guy, <laughs> and show up at a you know, couple of meetings where some other people might, and talk for about an hour, hour and a half, and your disease is arrested, they will sign over the deed to their house. And you got to drag us to meetings, don't you? 
in my, I don't know about here in, in, in Colorado or in Texas, but in, 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 in Nebraska, the, some of the people that get sent are, uh, they have the little three by five cards, and I tend, I tend to tell them that if they have a problem with the program, they're already being sponsored if they have a three by five card. <laughs> See, because that three by five card signifies that the people who gave you that three by five card trust us. Crackpots, fallen women, ne'er do wells, has beens, and never wases. <laughs> to verify that your butt has been at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> That's how credible you are at this point. <laughs> so, of <laughs> so, of course, you know, now I'm on my way to treatment. You know, I'm going to get educated about alcohol. It took him about 40 days to educate me about alcoholism. I saw the Father Martin movies. I saw the jelly neck chart of disease and recovery. I saw the cirrhotic livers. I, saw, I felt so sorry for you people. <laughs> I was willing to give a donation when I got back to the base. Because y'all were in bad shape. You really were. I was voted if it was a, 12 of us, 12 angry men, I like to call us. And um, <laughs> it was a vote three, three days before we graduated. Who was most likely to drink six months after getting out of there? And if I had voted, would have been unanimous. <laughs> Landslide, but we didn't even need Florida, you know? <laughs> Landslide victory for yours truly. I came back to the base with a guarded prognosis and orders to make three, count them, three Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And I walked into the room, that, that was when we still had the circle and the triangle with no AA in it, and it was, you know, hours. <laughs> you know, we still had the copyright and the whole thing, you know. Um, and I went into this room, and I saw these people, and they were like, Hi, how you doing? Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's so good to see you. Hi, how you doing? Like that. Would you like a cup of coffee? Here, have a seat. We're about to start the meeting. Woo! <laughs> I don't know if that was your experience, but that was mine. <laughs> they were happy to see me. And I was not happy to see them. <laughs> how dare you be so happy to see you? I don't even know you people. And, they, and then they got to it. They started with a prayer, ended with a prayer, and they passed the basket. And I went, ah, okay, I know what this is. You guys are a cult. You're going to try to jump me to Jesus. Make me shave my head, sell books at the airport, something like that. Little tambourine, orange outfit. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. So I got my arms folded waiting, because I know it's coming pretty soon. The building fund, the donations, or the missionary work y'all got going on in Africa. So, you know, something. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Instead, what I hear, you know, because I had known all about God. I mean, I, was, I knew all about it. You know, I went to Catholic school all the way up to my first year of college. You know, I left the Catholicism very early in that stage. Was practicing Islam for a while, sort of half measure in Islam, you know. Happy Ramadan, anybody's here. Not the way y'all would feed folks. I know it's true as hell nobody from there. <laughs> they would not be within 100 miles of this place, I tell you. Especially after that barbecue I had. Ooh, Lord. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> so at one time, there was this young lady um, that I was pursuing, and I wanted what she had, and I was willing to go to any lengths to get it. And she was in this Baptist choir, and so I joined the Baptist choir, and they got loaned because we were a young adult choir to a Methodist church. So on any given Sunday, I was a failed Catholic who was a practicing Muslim singing in a Baptist choir in a Methodist church. <laughs> had the Book of Mormon at home, had the English translation of the Quran, two versions of the Bible. I was the kind of guy that could stand in my doorway with a 36-ounce bottle of Colt 45 in my underwear and win an argument with a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> They would leave. <laughs> so I knew all about God. So I was waiting for that hard sell. Never came. What I got instead was people telling their stories. And they were telling the stuff about being naked on the lawn. One lady blew a 3-5 on her civilian job that morning. They busted her. And she hadn't had a drink that night before. So, you know, these are the kind of people, I, you know, I'm like, I was becoming embarrassed for them because they were telling me this stuff and they would laugh. They would just la laugh. They just, ha, 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 ha. you know, I'm like, how can you laugh about this kind of stuff? But they were so matter of fact about the things that were tragic or ugly or disgusting, things that I had done that I wasn't going to tell a soul. They were just ca carefree about. And it was something about that that made it attractive for, for me to keep coming back. 
And you know, and I'll tell you, if you're new in AA, a, a group is cunning, baffling, and powerful. They will make you do stuff you don't really want to do. You know, because they came up to me and said, Sterling, we really need your help. And I go, well, sure, anything I can do for you people. <laughs> <laughs> we need a coffee maker. Okay. I said, okay, fine, you know. So they gave me the key. Now I got the key. I got the key. I got the key. I'm coming two hours early for a 20-minute commitment to make coffee, you know. And I, didn't, I make terrible coffee. I make coffee so bad. We were in Japan. I made coffee one time for the Japanese, and they like it strong. And it did, they didn't like it. They, <laughs> they said, no, we'll send somebody in early from now on to make coffee there. So I, you just stay in your own. No, don't do this anymore. No, <laughs> you know. So deal was, I, I figured there was 16 people coming to the meeting, about 16 of them little. Yeah. Yeah, Starbucks ain't got nothing on me. I was making espresso back in the 80s, you know. So. so. I mean, we, we used a lot of cream in two weeks I made coffee. When we got in that circle, three, four people volunteered to be coffee maker next week. That's for sure. So, so that, if you ever, don't ever give up a service job. and never give up a service gig, you know, because we hire the handicapped and alcoholics now. Because they're fun to watch. And, you know, if you don't know how to do it, that's the prerequisite for getting the service gig. Not knowing how to do it. Because once you get good at it, we fire you and give you another job you don't know nothing about. <laughs> so we can watch you do that one all wrong. <laughs> that's, that's the highlight of our day. <laughs> I love that about AA. I really do. So I was chairing the meeting, sharing the, my experience, strength, and hope, which wasn't much. you know. And, but they would spend the rest of the meeting 12-stepping me. And it took those people a year. But in a year's time, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. There was one big guy, George. George was a big, tall, Navy guy. He liked hugging people. And I'm from New York. You're another man, you ain't hugging me. And George would chase me around a little room <laughs> to hug me. And one day he caught me. And I started really liking them hugs. So six months into sobriety, I think I'm gay. <laughs> if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous and you have crazy thoughts, what we would love for you to do is share those crazy thoughts with an old timer. They ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> you know, you could just walk up to oh, Joe, I think I'm gay. Well, really, uh, are you married? Yeah, to a woman? Yeah. Uh, do you like girls? Yeah, well, you're not gay. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Because <laughs> you got more crazy thinking to do. <laughs> Why get stuck on just one thing? <laughs> you know, because you end up taking actions on that one thing that really aren't going to work, you know? I, I'd end up moving to San Francisco somewhere hating it, you know? <laughs> so the deal was, you know, of course. They were loving, they were a really loving fellowship. I had a loving experience in the first year of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was in love with AA. I loved AA. One small problem in Alcoholics Anonymous. One small problem. Well, a couple, but this one really glared at me. Because when I first walked in, I saw these pictures. Picture them two old white guys. Yeah, them two, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And the three guys on the bed. So I knew, you know, and from the numbers of people that were showing up at the meetings, I kind of surmised, just extrapolating to the United States. I'm going, hmm, there's a real shortage of African Americans and alcoholics, no, I'm, just, I'm going to take it upon myself to get thousands of black folks in the AA. See, because I want another picture up on the wall. You know, Bill, Bob, Sterling, right in the middle. Right there. <laughs> AA, the next generation, you know what I'm saying? I rewrite the book later, because, you know, who knew anything about the Titanic, for Christ's sake, you know? This is, this is the 80s, you know? So I came to D.C. It was southeast side of D.C., as a matter of fact. Seemed to be thousands of black folks in that meeting, and alcoholics not all sober longer than me, kind of pissed me off. But the deal was, I pursued, I went to a lot of meetings. And I would say that the reason why I'm still in Alcoholics Anonymous, even though my first five years of Alcoholics Anonymous were not stellar sobriety, is that I went to meetings. I went to meetings for all the wrong readings, reasons, but I went to meetings. And I listened to people at those meetings. And I watched the folks in those meetings. And I could tell the difference between those that were going to stay and those that were going to go. Because, simply put, the ones that were staying were the ones that were smiling. The ones that were staying were the ones that were glad. The ones that were staying were the ones that were busy. And the ones that were staying were the ones that were happy, joyous, and free. And all the other ones were going to leave. And I got to a place of five years of sobriety where I didn't think I could be happy, joyous, and free, but I didn't want to go either. And I was stark raving sober. 
and I decided I'd either kill myself or get a sponsor. Equally tragic decisions. <laughs> I decided to go for the more temporary of the two. I'd get a sponsor and kill myself later, you know. And, a, and God, with a sense of humor, sent me to Omaha, Nebraska, which does not sound like AA Mecca to you, but it was for me because I went down the stairs of this Catholic church to a Monday, a Tuesday night meeting, and I found some people. Hi, how you doing? Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You're about to start the meeting. You want to sit over there? Ooh. You know, I was so dry I could have started a forest fire, and these people were just as enthusiastic and loving God and loving the program and just loving AA, and it was just so great and it was so wonderful and it was making me sick. But there was something about them. They had that freedom of being able to talk about stuff that was tragic and terrible, and even in sobriety, I was ashamed of, and they seemed to have no fear. And they were going everywhere, and they were doing all kinds of stuff, and they were acting in a way and manner that was attractive to me. So I decided to get this guy for my sponsor. You know, I've been told in many a discussion meeting, and you may have heard this in a discussion meeting or two, you know, the person getting the help, probably isn't getting near as much help as the person giving the help. You know, that's they, we like saying that kind of stuff, you know. So, so I found this one guy who would give me a resentment just like that, you know. I figured, well, you know, I'll, I'll ask him. The, he'd, he'd kind of pissed me off at first because what he did, he circled some meetings and said, if you don't want to hide in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll see you at these meetings. You know, and I went, oh, boy, because, you know, I've been, I've been sober five years. I'm an yeah. a, a icon, you know. <laughs> And this guy had the audacity to do that, you know. So I took his inventory that day. I took his inventory the next day. I took his inventory, I think, three straight days. I recommend if you've taken somebody's inventory that long and you don't have a sponsor and they're the same sex as you, get them for a sponsor. Because at least they can clean some stuff up. They're going to spend all that time in your head, you know. They can straighten the stuff, you know, move the furniture around and get it all squared away, you know. So I asked him, and he made me say, please, piss me off. And then he gave me the marching orders. He, he, he gave me some instructions on what to do if he was going to sponsor me and I was going to be an active member of his home group. And I complied with those dictates, rules, edicts, whatever you want to call them, because I was desperate. I had no other alternative. If I had had another card to play, I would have played it. But I was done. I was done. And I think the difference between any of the people whom I met in this sober journey from then till now that left and has never returned is I didn't leave because I kept staying surrendered. I kept saying, okay. I never said no. And I think that is the one thing that differentiates the happy, joyous, and free bunch, the rah-rah AA bunch, from the people that always have a problem with us, whether they're in our fellowship or not. Because there are people that have problems with us. And the deal is they're never happy. And they're never satisfied. And it's always a challenge to get them to do anything. Anything at all. But for the people that are happy, they're always doing stuff. Sometimes too much stuff. It's like herding cats sometimes getting alcoholics to sit down and shut up and sit still. and you know. But the deal is, that's just been my experience. And my sponsor has verified that. Because there's a lot of people that we know that should be walking this journey with us, they ain't here. They ain't here. I got in with a group of people that would caravan to another meeting and just take it over, you know, and just, you know, do these roundups and something, just do all kinds of service stuff, and it was getting really good. It was getting really good. I got to about 10, 11 years old, and I think I'm about, just about to get that AA brass ring, you know, just got it all coming together, getting awards at work, you know, still in the service, doing well. She wasn't happy, and my sponsor forced me to ask her that all-important question. And never ask a question you don't want to know the answer to, and I didn't really want to know the answer, but I had to ask the question, do you want to stay married to me? She said, nope. <laughs> so that kind of decided what we were going to do moving forward, you know. So, and I was, I was mortified. I mean, I was just, and you know how we do pain, you know. I'm, you know, I'm walking around the jaw tight, you know, throbbing at the temple, you know, just... Anything wrong, Sterling? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> you know? You know, so my sponsor put his arm around me, you know, and he just said, you know, oh, we're so blessed in AA to have the only man ever to get a divorce in our fellowship. <laughs> they're wise, but they're not kind. So I got a chance. I had to make an inventory. I had to get over that. 
And I had to do what I needed to do in order to stay in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can tell you that throughout my sobriety, it's been that way. Throughout my sobriety, there have been ups and downs. There have been challenges that happen to all the earth people out there, but because I'm alcoholic, I take it real personal sometimes. I sponsor a lot of guys, and none of their problems seem near as important as mine. <laughs> I mean, they will call me with some stuff, and I've always got an answer for them. And I'll hang up the phone, and I go, well, what about me? And I'll start down that road, another one will call, you know? And then that's just God's, God's way of just reminding me, you ain't all that, Sterling. You know? It's, you're just one of the many, you know? But it's, it's hard for me to do that. But I got, we got a divorce, and I, just, I, def, I decided that I really didn't want to be the way I was in that marriage. And, and my higher power, with his sense of humor, gave me an opportunity. I was working two jobs, going in the military. I was sponsoring guys, doing service work. And the last thing I needed was a relationship. <laughs> So that's exactly what I got. <laughs> got an opportunity to, to meet a woman and, and spend some time, and, and we dated, and we hit it off, and we've still been hitting it off, and y'all paid to bring her out. Here's Roxanne, would you stand up for me, please? I don't get to do that often, so when I do, it really embarrasses her, and I just love it. She will get me back. She will get me back. Yeah, she get me back. She will. But that's okay. I live on the edge. What the hell? <laughs> but the deal was we dated, and, and I got shipped out to California, and I didn't really want to go, but I knew that the reason why I was going to California is because, obviously, there was something I needed to do out there. I must have a mission, you know? I, and I've got a message, so I must be, oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to go through the Rocky Mountains and come out of Reno, Nevada, and come into Sacramento and say, everybody, you know? And God, with his sense of humor, broke that uh, car down in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. <laughs> Transmission fell out of that four-banger Nissan stanza I had. And I found three things in Cheyenne, Wyoming that day. I found a La Quinta Inn. I found an Amco station for the car. And a Quonset hut right at the end of Main Street. There was a picture of these two old white guys. <laughs> the orange ashtrays. Remember the orange ashtrays? Oh, weren't they so cool? We never emptied them either, didn't we? They just piled up the whole pyramid of cigarette ash. And, but, but man, we had the orange ash tray. There was a guy named Jim. There's always a guy named Jim. You know? So I spent a couple of days in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and then ended up without a car in Sacramento during one of the worst rainy seasons in Sacramento history. And I was a weather forecaster in the military, so it was really funny. I spent five years in Sacramento, and a lot of things happened to me in Sacramento that, that helped me to develop a program that I, know I can't be proud of, but that I can rely on. Because I'm, I'm not a great example of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I can be very effective when I get out of my own head. See, because I know the game. I used to play a lot of basketball, and they say, if you want to play well, you got to play people that are better than you. And I was, I was always hanging around those that were better at this than me, the ones that were walking ahead of me. I tried to focus in on them. And in the five years that I was in Sacramento, I had an opportunity to sponsor a lot of different guys from a lot of different perspectives, from a lot of different places. And I had to climb back in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we had to look at the solutions as they were outlined in the book. Because that was not worth the dispute. They could argue about my experience. They could even argue about my attitudes and opinions about things. But if it was down in black and white written in 1934, okay, we'll have to go with that. We'll have to go with that. And that was the default position. And you know, I, was, I was involved with and privy to helping a lot of people. Not because I'm a great carrier of the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, but because I was available. And God uses what's available. I always say you've got to have a God to live with a drunk. Whether you be the drunk or you live with the drunk, you've got to have a God. And that climbing in that book and being willing to help these men helped my sobriety because it enhanced my spirituality. I grew in my understanding and my effectiveness. And that's my responsibility today in Alcoholics Anonymous, to care as much as I possibly can for a person that is trying to stay sober because I can't do anything about my own sobriety. I can't do anything about my own recovery or my own spirituality even. But I can do something, even if that something is just sitting there till 3 o'clock in the morning listening to you ramble on and on about your problems. I can do that. I may not really want to, but I can do it. 
I can do the service work. I can rewrite the bylaws as much as I hate doing that all the time. We always seem to need to rewrite bylaws in the end groups. I don't understand it, but the deal is I can do that. I can step up and do what I need to do to help this program move forward in carrying the message to the still suffering alcoholic. You know, I can do that, and I'm responsible for doing that. And that's what it, I got taught in California. I got out of the service, got out of the Air Force, honorably discharged, a couple, gave me a couple of medals even. It was great, fantastic. And I came back to Omaha, Nebraska to live with my wife and my, my new family and the, the fellowship I crave and got a job, got a pretty good job, lost that job, broke my leg. Uh, all kinds of interesting things started happening because I was in life, life on life's terms. And life on life's terms really doesn't care how long you've been sober. I have told life many times, listen, I've been sober over 30 years. <laughs> and life goes, so? <laughs> you know, I mean, it just doesn't matter. You know, life is going to be life. And, and that was the, that's the challenge today in Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor a lot of men that are going through challenges. I have watched people in my home group. I have watched so many people in my home group in situations where they are falling apart. Their lives are in shambles. And they walk into the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and they hand this new guy the chicken with the half a cup of coffee, their phone number, knowing full well the last thing they need is a call at 3 o'clock in the morning from this guy. But they do it anyway because it was done for them. And because of that, I know for a fact I got to keep doing this deal. I got to keep doing this deal. You know, because they inspired me. Inspiration is the greatest thing going on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because what I can do, or what is done to me by me seeing that is, something is entered inside of me that will motivate me to do it for somebody else. You know, I have watched many of loving people pass on to the great big meeting. We lost a lot of heroes. Lost a lot of heroes in Alcoholics Anonymous. And now I'm thinking, you know, I was talking to another guy that's got 30 years, and I was telling him, I was going, you remember when we used to be able to defer to the old timer? You know, and they, yeah, I remember, yeah, we used to do all that. I said, yeah, well, they ain't there no more, it's us. We are now them. <laughs> you know, and I don't think I got the juice. I really don't. Because I don't have the kind of spirituality that I saw when I first walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, but I got the willingness to try to get there. You know, and I know that if I walk behind those, those shadows, I'll, be, I'll get there. I really will get there. I know that I will. I know that I will. We had some challenges. I mean, Roxanne and I have had challenges. She's had physical challenges. I mean, I'm powerless over alcoholism, but I'm also powerless over breast cancer. And she got it, and, you know, I had to go help folks because I couldn't do anything for her. So I was in meetings trying to help people. Ain't nothing funnier than watching a drunk trying to help folks. <laughs> Come here, let me help you. <laughs> I'm going to read this book. I'm going to read this book. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're going to get some help. Because <laughs> you know? I, I got to fix her, and I can't fix her, so I'm going to help you. <laughs> you know, you know? And that's where it was. I was on it. I was way on it. Got a little broke. We had financial problems, and I, was, I had a car in Omaha, Nebraska. I had a car that didn't have any heat. Yeah, see? Yeah, yeah a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, that's real spiritual. Yeah. You know, because I've been sober so long, you know, I'm just, I'm, I've got a car that don't have any heat. Ha, 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 ha. I get a call from my sponsor one day, and he says, uh, you report to this place. Uh, there was a, a mechanic who was in the program, and you're supposed to leave your car there to get it fixed, and... Uh, my brother Pigeon was dispatched to come keep an eye on me, and you know, it's not a question of who did it or who's done it. You just say thank you. And I said, yes, sir. You know, now, when you're six months sober, you tell everybody about that. But when you're over 30 years sober, it's a little embarrassing. You know? And I got a lesson in look good. See, I like looking good. And I like being in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous because I, I got a big mouth and I like to be seen. But I also know that I got to remain in Alcoholics Anonymous. And in order to remain in Alcoholics Anonymous, I got to be the right size. And the right size is I'm no worse or better than any other drunk in the place. I kind of love it when we bring wet drunks to the meeting. Because that, you know, old time again, that, oh yeah. <laughs> See, I got to remember that. I got to remember that feeling of being in a room full of people that have a purpose and I didn't have one. I got to remember what it felt like to be all alone. I got to remember what it felt like to have no answers and knew I had no answers but still had to step out here in the world and pretend like I did. I remember that. 
I remember the insane behavior and trying to even trying to rationalize it in my own mind. I remember that. And if I ever get to a place where I get too big to remember that, then you people won't look that good. And come on back, baby. And I'll be going out that door to do it one more time. And I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to feel that way again. So I will do my level best to stay the right size in Alcoholics Now It's my responsibility. I owe it to all of those people, many of whom didn't have nothing to do with this program. I mean, one of the, the Islamic prayers I did learn was that there, there's a general prayer that prays for all of those who are suffering and it asks upon the God of their understanding to relieve their suffering. And I don't know of many drunks in the final stages that ain't dealing with the four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And there are prayers for people like that all over the world. So there are people every day praying that I stay sober and I don't know their names. And the least I can do is to try to adopt, the, apply these principles at Kmart and Walmart and gas station, you know, where it's difficult, you know. Because I'm one of them kind of people, I count how many items you got in the shopping basket. <laughs> Fifteen items or less, you got 30 items, you need to die. <laughs> I don't think a judge will convict me either. I go, 19, 20, bang, you know? <laughs> and that's not what y'all taught me. If it ain't polite in AAA, that's what y'all taught me. That's the deal, to never say no, that I'm responsible. I'm one of his kids. I'm supposed to keep the plug in the jug and not hurt any of his other kids. That's my primary purpose, keep the plug in the jug and not hurt any of his other kids. I'm included, but I take second. You're first. That's hard, but I keep going. I keep playing with the people that play better than I do so that I can get better at this thing. I'll close with a story about a guy trying to paint his house. He was painting his house. He had a two-year-old helping him, and we all know two-year-olds are no help. <laughs> he found a picture of all the continents on the planet, and he tore it up into pieces, and he told the child to go in the next room and put this puzzle together, thinking that it would keep the child occupied for a long time. About five minutes pass, she comes out, finished. He goes, how'd you do that so fast? Because there was some, some of the continents, he wasn't sure where they would go himself, you know. How'd you do it so quick? Well, there was a man on the other side. So you put the man together, the world comes together. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with a lot of issues. A lot of issues. And Alcoholics Anonymous said, basically, Sterling, we know there was some compelling issues for the world to die, but instead, why don't we set that aside? Let's give you a God that loves you, desperately. Let's give you a place where you can talk about the problems that are going on in your life one day to the next. Let's give you a room full of people that are willing to listen to those problems and help you climb out of them and to help you develop a relationship with a God that loves you desperately. And then, armed with that, let's go back out in the world and see if we can not make some difference. So I would challenge any newcomer. You can do the 90 and 90, you can do the 100 and 100, you can do whatever you need to do in order to stay here. But give us everything that doesn't work in your life and let us help you let us let us allow God to help you get that stuff all squared away I am looking forward to the rest of this week I know who are going to be here this week I know these people and they are inspiring and they are good people and I would strongly recommend that you interrupt your feeding to give them all a listen to. I'm grateful to be here in sober. Thanks. <laughs>